This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Everywhere we turn these days, there seems to be a new fad around cleaner eating or secrets to living a healthier life. My guest today is Alex Stewart, a speaker, writer, podcaster, and low-tox living expert. She's also soon to add author to that list of tags. Passionate about her purpose, Alex has grown her business organically, no pun intended, but with a clear mission to educate, inspire, and share, devoid of the usual preaching we often hear from those in that health and well-being arena. She has recipes, e-courses, and much more to help us all on the road to living a life free of harm or hype. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you so much for having me, Amber. I'm really looking forward to our chat. So starting back to your childhood, because I think it's a good sort of point to to begin this journey, reflecting on this upbringing that you had, were you in a house that was really health conscious and were you really aware of what you ate, what you did, what you put in your body? Like I'm picturing, you know, were you kind of the house that had the no greenhouse gas emission stickers on your car <laughs> and <laughs> hemp clothing and face creams that you made yourself or not, was your family life not like that? Oh, my gosh, not that. All, not at all. And I think it's really interesting. When I was born, I was born in London in the mid 70s, and we moved to Chicago when I was one, and we lived in Chicago in the late 70s. Now, anyone who knows their history knows that that was peak feminist movement, and all the women were going back to work. And it was really the time when the food companies started moving in and saying, Don't worry about the cooking, you know, we'll take care of that for you. So that processed food amped up big time in America in the late 70s, and we were really in the thick of that. And and, you know, when, you know, my mom grew up on a tiny island, Mauritius, and um, and all these sorts of things are really exciting. You think, oh, wow, that tastes nice and that's interesting. And that, so we really became the, oh, there's a new product on the market family and we always had it. So I always had like the coolest, newest snacks in my lunchbox when we got school, things like roll-ups and the snacks and all those kinds of things. But we did eat really well at home. So we always ate a really great family dinner, often sort of French, basic, simple French food inspired, some Mauritian things like curries and lentils and all that kind of stuff. But no, by no means were we a family that were the hippie disconnect at all. We were very much the family of the 80s where everything was very cool, exciting, different, and where you really didn't think yet that anything might be unsafe or not so great for you. If it was on the shelf, you just assumed it was it was good for the taking. So no, definitely did not grow up as a hippie family. And that came much later for me to be aware of what was what was going in and on my body and what was happening all around me that came literally probably late 20s I started to think of that. Excellent. Well, we will get there, but I'm curious to know then about your early career. What did you do? Mm-hmm. Why? And what was that experience like? Do you know, I really just had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I finished school, did reasonably well, studied an arts degree because I did love my languages, but I loved politics as well. And so I did European political science and modern languages. And with that degree, I expected to at some point then start looking into international studies and diplomacy. But I didn't really love diplomacy in the end. It wasn't, it felt too red tape-ish and I was always a bit of a freedom fighter, a bit of a <laughs> bit of a breakaway gal. And I just thought, no, that was just like you would literally be surrounded by rules and regulations all the time and on tender hooks as to what you could and couldn't say. And it just didn't appeal to me at all. And so I ended up, um, a girlfriend of mine just casually said, you know, you're really good at recommending. You're always the one who always knows what skincare we should use and face creams and makeup and all that kind of like I was always everybody's go-to recommender for all sorts of things. In fact, across all areas of life, I was called Dr. Alex because I always seemed to know what to do if someone was unwell and I, I just loved helping people. <laughs> Maybe way before uh, we, we had, you know, Google Doctor online. Yeah, exactly. There I was. was. Yeah, totally. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I actually just fell into the cosmetics industry and I started off as a counter girl and then I was a counter manager and then I was doing so well at that that people in the head office kind of thought, well, let's bring her into the management team side and became account executive and then account manager and then in, in the end a regional manager of key accounts for Australia, New Zealand, French Pacific. And, um, and that was a very luxurious uh, French brand that I worked for for many years. And, um, well, not many, many, but about six, I guess, until my mid-20s. And, That's quite a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess it is. But I started to sort of feel like I was allergic to the job, to the industry, to it, like it just physically I was getting more and more headaches and I had been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome at the time and it it just there was something about my motivation that just completely tanked towards the end and I literally felt allergic to coming to work and I think, you know, that was one of my first, you know, when you're in your mid-20s, that's like, whoa. And then I felt a huge wave of shame, like a lack of gratitude. There I was in my early 20s travelling to Tahiti in business class, doing training sessions and And, you know, it was a very amazing job for someone in their early 20s to have. And yet there I was feeling so ungrateful, like I wanted to leave it. So my Catholic guilt really struggled there because that was uh, 13 years of Catholic school. And I think anyone out there who's done that knows the ramifications (laughs) of um, (laughs) lifelong by the sounds of it. And so did you then decide to to, to, to leave completely and go somewhere else or what did you do? I did. I literally left. I left and... um, I was a good singer and I thought, you know what, I just, I had been starting to be booked for gigs. I was writing songs for people's launches and I just thought, you know what, like I'm in my mid-20s, my friends have done all this backpacking and all these exciting adventures throughout all of their early 20s while I was working my tail off. I'm going to be a singer and and so I did and I was a singer for three or four years in nightclubs and bars and, and pubs doing the, the kind of acoustic circuit with a songwriter buddy um, that I had and uh, and then I kind of very quickly realised that unless you were um, uh, really committed, really like to gigging every single night or and rehearsing every single day, which I wasn't, if I'm to be brutally honest with myself, I was never going to earn a living wage. It was a nice, you know, few hundred bucks a week but it was nothing that could um, in in the way that I was doing it or in the way that I could see possibility. I just couldn't see possibility and I think that's a huge part of um, that gut feeling of connecting to purpose and if you can't see a clear path or a sense of purpose then it's probably something that if you do try to undertake it, you'll be hitting your head against a brick wall a lot and there won't be much flow. And and so I ended up bartending to supplement the income while I tried to figure out whether I was going to stay singing um, but ended up becoming a really well-known bartender. So I was winning competitions and being flown around the world and all sorts of crazy things for the next few years uh, by liquor companies. Um, winning cocktail competitions and um, and I think it was quite novel very male industry to be a woman who could I was gonna say you would have been like one of the few females in that I mean I'm still in the 1980s movie Mm. cocktail with Brian Brown and Tom (laughs) Cruise that is the image we we Mm. have you know you do see female bartenders perhaps not at that top level though that you're talking about in the era that you perhaps worked as well in the 90s I was literally one of the first in the early 2000s. So um, now there are many amazing female bartenders. Um, but I always used to get like articles would be written about me and the question would invariably come. So as the best female bartender, what do you think? You know, it's like, what? but bartending is a profession that there are men and women in. Why are we calling me the best female bartender? I'd much prefer to be either not the best bartender um, but like a well-regarded one than the best female, but I didn't need to have that segregated out um, based on my gender. Um, I was, yeah, it always used to grate on me, but I think I was just still a bit um, formative in my opinions on feminism and, and, and equality as to articulating why I didn't like being singled out as a woman who was bartending. But, but you know, chefs get it, female chef. Why does female have to go in front of chef? Chef's a chef. So um, anyway... Um, so lo and behold, uh, the, the toll taken on my body of working till 3 a.m. in the morning um, for many years uh, was, was very much taking hold and I thought, I, I can't, this is not sustainable. So I started consulting and, um, 
And I absolutely love consulting to the hospitality industry, especially businesses like Maryvale Group who love improving themselves and always working on how they can be best in class. So that work has made me very happy. Um, and, in fact, I have another business where I still actively um, uh, run a couple of programs for a couple of large hospitality groups. But um, but I had a baby, my little guy, and that was nearly nine years ago, and and couple that with a whole bunch of health issues that I was having in my late 20s and early 30s, um, I started to really look into exactly what I was eating and exactly what I was putting on my skin and, you know, it really horrified me that there was so much research. I mean, and admittedly, it's mainly animal studies at this point in time. But, um, you know, we are animals too at the end of the day. And I'm a huge fan of the precautionary principle um, when science is still arguing between themselves as to whether something's harmful. And I was like, well, why are we all using it while there's still an argument? <laughs> Should we not wait for consensus? Absolutely. No, I think that's, <laughs> yeah, I I can see that link now between all the environments you've worked in too and how you've come and obviously your own experiences of health and well-being and not feeling great and working out, you know, what works for mm. you and what doesn't. But were you sort of immediately interested in this idea of the impact of toxins and the impact it has on on us generally in terms of our, you know, we- yes. everyday life? Uh, was it something that gradually grew in you and you thought, oh, look, I could actually do something okay, with so this? so that for me happened in three waves. First wave was realising that I stopped getting migraines when I left the beauty industry just completely from overnight, just not in that world anymore, and, and that I found intriguing. Second wave was I finally saw a naturopath after over a decade of multiple cases of tonsillitis and um, and I was on like the third round of antibiotics and nothing was working. So like, you know, they now had me on Mac Daddy stuff because I'd had it so many times yeah. and for so many years. Yes. Um, and, uh, and she just huffed and puffed and put me on three things and gave me a, a sort of fasting diet of just really well cooked brown rice, chicken stock and carrots um, and uh, and some chicken livers if I could uh, stomach them, which I did because I thought anything that's going to get me to not um, feel like this would be a miracle. And um, and within three days I didn't have tonsillitis, uh, no drugs, and um, I've had two mild cases of it in the last 15 years compared to five times a year. So. Wow. So there was the evidence. Yes. There was your evidence and you might you must be thinking, if I am experiencing this, you know, epiphany yeah. and this change, there must be other people out there who can benefit from this. Oh, my gosh, Amber. It really then, and then the final wave was when my son was born and scrutinising everything I was going to put on his skin and feed him and thinking, oh, my gosh, just because it's on a shelf does not actually mean that it's safe. Like that, that is not enough assurance. They are completely self-regulated companies, so they can just say that they've done an internal study. It doesn't even need to be third-party independently studied to, um, to compare that, um, that, uh, that finding or that result that they publish um, to go on a shelf. And that just, that like my, my 16-year-old Greenpeace justice feed the world, geld off loving, you know, kind of me as a teen yes. <laughs> um, just came like roaring out of my chest and just I just went, this is so uncool. And then from there just started, just, you know, started reading. I thought before I did anything, like it wasn't even, I wasn't even, I didn't even know what blogs were. I couldn't even tell you how you would publish one. I just had no idea they existed because this was nine years ago. Um, and, uh, and so I just started reading and I, every time I read a book that was really well referenced and researched and then had its recommended reading, I'd then go on to read all of those books so that, you know, it was like a, a bit of a referral system for me. And I read about 20 books in, I thought I got to start writing stuff. No one I know knows any of this stuff. And I see kids getting grommets and tonsils and adenoids out and, you know, all these all these crazy operations that really, um, unfortunately, are largely due to the way we're eating when it comes to ENT stuff. And then in terms of early puberty, um, crazy things like um, uh, micro penises in boys when they're born and all sorts of stuff. 
Yes, like, and um, hormones and chicken are the one that always stands out for me. Just, oh, my you know, gosh, like, exactly. When hormones were allowed in chicken and we went through a huge phase of eating a heck of a lot of chicken in the late 80s. Um, yeah, it was all about chicken. Apricot chicken. It was all about chicken. chicken. I remember my dad saying, I just can't eat chicken anymore, and he had man boobs, and they went when we stopped eating all the chicken. Like that just says it all. <laughs> Men aren't supposed to get boobs. You know, so all of these sorts of things were just like over and over again, there would be more and more revelations. I would be like, okay, in everything I've ever done, it's always been training, motivation, getting people excited, making good quality recommendations. I'm now actually going to use all of these skills that I've garnered over the last couple of decades and do something useful with them for for me, for the planet, for people who feel like they want to connect with that information and so I just started writing a few little articles and originally it was just on a random WordPress site that I started and and then I formalised things a little bit more about a year into that and I've been doing it ever since, so about seven years. That's amazing. So lo- the Low Tox Life site is incredible mm. and does have lots of well-researched recipes and ideas and your e-courses and other sort of speaking engagements where people can actually, you know, experience your ideas in, in different formats. What is your greater goal in sharing all this in terms of, you know, new findings or the healthy recipes or even your personal experiences? What are you hoping to achieve? Do you know what? My favourite thing to do for someone is to make them feel like change can be a positive, empowering and super exciting, enlightening thing. Because I grew up in the 80s where change was really strict, crazy, weird, low-fat diets, which, by the way, are really not useful to anyone. Um, Full of sugar, awful, made you hungry all the time. Exactly. Like, remember those lean piece of chicken breast and try not to put any oil? You know, here's some tips on how to not use oil in your salad dressing. It's like, well, how are we supposed to absorb all the fat-soluble vitamins that transport minerals to our teeth and bones? Like, no wonder we've got all these crooked, narrow mouths and... And, and a whole bunch of people snoring. Like there's, there, you know, there's so much evidence around facial structure and, and vitamin and mineral intake and like just all this stuff. I just started to learn all this stuff and I was like, oh, my gosh. So my greater goal is to help people rather than feel the doom and gloom that we feel after we see you know, incredible TED Talks like the um, pivotal TED Talk of Al Gore's on climate change, for example, like I have enough knowledge to not be terrified by that because I feel like I know exactly what I need to do to act. But so many people see things like that or see the epidemic of diabetes or cancer or heart disease and things and that and that makes them scared inside and we're scared because we don't know. It's kind of like racial tensions. People are scared because they just don't know enough about the other people and basic needs aren't being met. And it's the same with fear around wellness and fear around um, sustainability. And once you like, yeah, so my goal really is, is to help people feel excited, empowered, like we know exactly what we need to do to move the needle and make our populations healthier, stronger, more resilient. And, um, And in turn, because it's part and parcel, the decisions that we make to do that are the same decisions that make our planet healthier. Great. That's that's huge, but it does make sense. And I guess I'd be curious to know, in the simplest way, how do you define, for example, real food? Like what's your sort of parameter for your personal preference on on how we should eat? Is it all about organic? Is it all about if it doesn't come from the ground or, you know, off, off an animal, we can't actually eat it? Like wh- how, how do you define yeah. that in, in your low-tox sense? Well, so I think the most important thing is, and we don't talk about this enough because it's happening everywhere and so many people are doing it, most of us are doing it, is that we need to get the universal nasties out of the way. And by that I mean additives, preservatives and things that the human body does not understand as information. So things like vegetable oils that have been highly processed and um, and uh, genetically modified foods and things like that. And I interviewed a wonderful professor on genetic modification and the impact, uh, potential impact on um, the human population based on how lax the testing is before um, genetically modified seeds are allowed to go on the market. And it, it, I was, I, it was such a clear moment when he said the human human body when we eat is taking in information it has been designed to take in a certain type of information and what information we are now giving it which we can see is different 
um, is unrecognisable. And so it gets very confused. Um, and it's largely thought that that's why there is the huge slew of autoimmune diseases now um, where the body's attacking itself because it doesn't recognise something as food and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. So um, I feel like I tangented there, but um, I guess suffice it to say that real food really needs to be stuff that our body's going to recognise, stuff that your grandmother or great-grandmother, if you're a bit younger, would have eaten and served at a table. Uh, however, in Anglo-Saxon culture, what our grandparents would have served at the table is still quite a lot of um, breads and grains, and we need to look at where those are coming from today. And I um, and how much we have because we used to eat a heck of a lot more veggies than grains and that it seems like grains have really overtaken the veggies. Um, that is true. If you look at the modern plate, it'd be good to sort of do that kind of snapshot of all. I'm sure it's being yeah. done, but, you know, what the plate looked like in the 1950s, totally. the 60s, yeah. the 70s, the heinous 80s was all, you know, take away food and, um, like you say, things out of a jar that are equal to stir fry and all that, and then the 90s and now. I mean, it's just the portions as well as maybe the contents. Yeah. It's unrecognisable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Double the portion, weird contents that our bodies don't recognise. And, um, and I, I really think if we just double or triple our veggie intake, um, and as Dr. Terry Walls says, veggies, um, especially the ones where it's the same colour the whole way through the vegetable, like a beetroot or a dark green leafy um, or purple cabbage, you know, where that colour's going all the way in, that's when you know they're the best veggies, the highest amount of nutrients like pumpkin, sweet potato, um, uh, in fruits like berries, for example, whereas if you think of an apple, it's like the dark colour on the outside and then it's pale on the inside and that's not as much nutrient bang for your buck as, as really intensely coloured all the way through veggies and fruits. So that's one of my favourite tips. Um, but if we do that and we just ditch all those weird additives, I mean, if you look at, like I, I talk about this in the book that's coming up, which is a, like a th three examples of snacks or things that we put commonly um, on our plates. And one of them is a list of ingredients of a packaged um, cheese spread and cracker kind of snack that people would commonly put in a lunchbox and you know and just makes me laugh because they say made with 50 percent real cheese and I'm like so what's the other 50 percent um yeah right what else are we <laughs> yeah. eating here and like we've been conned into thinking that that is the only way that we can maintain sanity and get a lunchbox out the door when you know when did we become so so um, unable to think critically about how easy and convenient just cutting a couple of pieces of cheese and chucking them in a little container and chucking a bunch of crackers in another container was. And then there's no additives, there's no weirdness. It's just flour, water and cheese, so rennet, salt, milk, um, as opposed to the 14 ingredients that are in the other spread and um, eight ingredients in the cracker, you know. Like it's just... It, we've just strayed so far from things because this convenience message has been pumped into us, making us think that we need these food companies and we need these products instead of produce, um, that it's really made us lose our way a little bit. And there's nothing better than seeing someone's light go on about, um, about that and about shifting from product-based buying to produce-based buying and just falling in love with real food again. And it takes time. It's not an overnight gig. It's really about kind of, you know, celebrating with recipes and getting the kids in the kitchen more and cooking together. And even like I even suggest things like everybody go on Pinterest. If if your kids are getting a bit, I don't do the veggies. And say, okay, you don't have to eat it, but you have to help me decide what we're going to cook and let's choose the best, tastiest looking sweet potato recipe that we can find online. When the kids had the buy in there and then they make it with you, there's going to be massive uptake of possibility that they might actually try the thing because they've got a vested interest in that dish now. So your ethos is about education and encouragement versus being a purist in this path to low-tox choices which are good for us. I love the idea of traditional food as, you know, food as medicine and the interest in gluten-free recipes if that's what you need and also reducing sugar if you're baking healthy treats for your family. I'd be curious to know why being moderate has been a key part of your message and how you keep people engaged knowing it's okay to sometimes take shortcuts or allow your child at the party to have the treat rather than being, you know, overly governing everything we eat so it becomes almost 
dictatorial. And I think that's the danger sometimes with the health and wellbeing messages you get from some people that you you feel shamed, you feel food shame if you eat something that perhaps isn't the best thing, but it's only an occasional thing. How have you packaged yeah, that message? Yeah, so I people? see this as much in the reducing toxic exposures day to day as I do in the food scene. Um, that sense of shame, like I haven't done a good enough job. I, you know, I, I, like I even saw someone post once that their child had to be hooked up to an IV and IVs are quite a bendy stretchy plastic that use phthalates which are a hormone disruptive chemical um, going oh well here we go like all that good effort gone and I'm like no you've missed the point we do what we do most of the time to be okay with what we need to do some of the times or you know to be okay with the go with the flow moment and to certainly be okay with critical medical care because it's a freaking lifesaver right so, you know, when I've seen Absolutely. things like this, it's really been alarm bells for me to make sure that I c- continually and, and obsessively um, share and emphasise that idea that we are all just doing the best we can and sometimes we have to go with the flow. And that sometimes we have to go with the flow might look like, you know what, it's 6.30, we're all at the beach, the friends have suggested fish and chips okay, this is our night where we just don't care about the vegetable oil. We don't have it in our pantry. We don't cook with it through the week. And, you know, what happens once in the month is not going to impact what happens the other 30 days of that month um, because you're doing such great work and your body can bounce back to a certain degree. And we do have detoxification systems that can handle a moderate amount of toxins. The problem is, though, and the reason we need to ramp up our detoxification pathways these days in so many people's cases is that we're, it's just too much. Like our, our systems just can't handle this much stuff that they were never designed to handle. Um, so really that's that's what I do. I just say, you know what, like have the gelato after the, the cinema when everybody's gone to see a movie. Don't worry about it and certainly don't feel judged or ashamed. Like what a beautiful moment to share with your friends. Like just get a single scoop if if you know it doesn't suit you super well or, or say, you know what, I, I might just have a mineral water, like if you really don't like it. Like so often we place so much. Absolutely. Um, so much uh uh, importance on the food or on the um, toxin-free choice, if you like, that we're not picking up on some of the beautiful moments that there are many other reasons to be enjoying that moment that don't have anything to do with either of those things. And um, and that's human connection and, and hanging out with our friends. And, and then, you know, the other thing that I always talk about just to make sure that people feel um, supported through that is that if they have made a decision because it really suits their family better based on health challenges they might be experiencing or simply just wanting to live healthier and if they've felt judged by their friends, the best thing you can do is to just have everybody over and cook up a feast and have it not be about the food. Don't even talk about how something might be gluten-free or dairy-free. Don't even give it a label. We love labels. I think labels are really detrimental to um, societal uh acceptance if you like um because then that you then get labeled as the person who is that and we are so much more than the way we eat so to really make sure that people say why don't you come into my world taste all this beautiful food see how delicious it is see how we're all having a great time now stop bugging me about it i I eat gluten free because that's how it suits me you know like everybody should exactly exactly no it all all is crystal clear when you put it like that and it does take away that that sense of guilt, which we often ex- experience. I'd love to change tack a little bit to ask you about um, how you've actually monetized what you do. So the idea that, you you know, obviously you had a customer experience training background, you've created this amazing community and you've managed to make this your mm. full-time job, if you like, no more yeah. working in bars yeah. till 3 a.m. for you. And I guess the takeout tip for listeners is around, you know, how do you take your passion and make make a living? You don't have to give us all your secrets, but, I mean, what's – What's been the process? Has it been sort of just building? Is it about, you know, I guess having subscriptions? So How have you really me, done this? it ended up taking the form of me realising that I was putting so much into this work and, um, and changing people's lives and not actually receiving any financial remuneration at all, like just doing it for free. And it started, it was a really confronting moment where I thought, I, I, hey, but can I charge for this? And it's like, well, you know, like there's a lot of professions where people change people's lives really obviously and they get paid really handsomely for it. And um, while I haven't quite figured out how to be paid handsomely, 
Um, I've certainly replaced a regular like market salary um, that I would be on in, in any other organisation kind of thing for myself. And the way I've done that um, and hired three beautiful part-timers as well is to um, create instead of writing all of this advice privately to people through emails and private messages and, and um, Instagram messages and all the places people can message you, I've created courses and um, the courses help people connect with the information and with like-minded people who also want that information. And we've created those courses um, by responding to the biggest topics of demand for my audience. So that originally started with Go Low Tox, which is the um, the fastest way to reduce day-to-day toxin exposure um, that exists because you have all the information there. You have me coaching it, et cetera. Then you have Real Food Rockstars, which is basically the same but for food, really learning about sustainability, where food comes from, how to make sustainable choices, how to make health choices based on starting to raise your awareness about what suits you. And then we've got other ones that are a bit more topic-focused like Preconception Ninja, Um, inflammation ninja uh, because inflammation is huge these days whether it's arthritic or um or or, um yeah just so many different forms of inflammation uh and um low-tox kids so um and thrive of course which helps parents create a rock solid food foundation for their kids because um in anglo cultures we're not so good at that we seem a bit um um uh, disempowered by how to teach our kids how to eat real food and love real food as if that was just what we eat rather than like branded yogurts and branded cereals and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, that, that's essentially how it's become, it's become an online education platform. So it's a one to many thing now. It's absolutely, you've been able to go one to many, which I think is the key to scaling to an extent, you know, just being able to reach more people. Um, e-courses are great because people can do it in their own time and, and still feel connected. So that's, but I also feel like I'm achieving more of my goal, which is to reach more people, um, in a more effective way. So it actually works in a really beautiful organic way that way it doesn't feel like I'm trying to get money out of people it feels like this is how we can achieve the greatest amount of change the best way possible absolutely so you do have a book coming out and I just want to touch on that briefly tell us about the title and the content if you can and what do you dream of it doing besides obviously being a bestseller what what are you really hoping (laughs) that a book will do that maybe you haven't been able to do in the in the world of your online site and obviously speaking to people about about your passion for low-tox living yeah, so the book is um, very originally named Low Tox Life and uh, it's a guide for a healthier you and a happier planet is um, the little byline. And essentially I've divided it into uh, four chapters, food, body, mind and home. And it serves as a guide that I'm hoping will be super well-thumbed by people going back and having another look and trying another recipe and um, through all four ways that one can live a low-tox life. Because for me, living low-tox is really just about raising your awareness on um, how what we put on in us and have all around us impacts our health and the planet's health. It's really important that we get that environmental connection because I think that really helps people stay super motivated to make it a part of their life as opposed to just a fad or a diet might. Um, and, uh, and we go through. So in the food chapter, we just talk really briefly, similarly in the way that we did today, just about what actually constitutes real food, the things to minimize. And, you know, I laugh and say, look, this isn't about saying, oh, I can't have that UHT dash of milk in my morning tea at the school, you know, like just have the milk if you really fancy it. It's not about those tiny little things that we might do on the odd time. It's really about adopting a way of eating that's better for us and the planet most of the time Um, because, you know, I think if we work with that 90-10 or 80-20, we're just going to get so far so fast that that's a beautiful thing to work towards and it feels much more manageable for people. Exactly. Um, and And then we do that through the home chapter. So we talk about some of the biggest pollutants in our home space, um, through either furniture or textiles, um, the air that we're breathing in, mould, lead, dust, all that kind of stuff. And then we talk about um, in the body chapter all of the different um, nasties that we can look out for and, and switch over to and whether you're a DIY person, there's a, a few really gorgeous DIY recipes in there, or if you're more of a product person, we're going to be encouraging people to head to the website and we're going to have a whole bunch of resources across all of the um, different um, things that you can get online, great safe places to shop 
um, and we'll have that for several countries, which will be really great. Um, and then the mind chapter, which is really important. It's such an important piece of the puzzle. So many people, you know, I've got to get my food right. I've got to get my, you got to get the crap out of my skincare and everything. It was so stressed. And then like stress will kill us much faster than those two things will ever have a chance. Absolutely. That's the thing, right? It's about not creating yeah. more anxiety in your exactly. life. It's about exactly. and I see working towards the good stuff. So much anxiety and it just doesn't need to be there. Everyone's working towards the good stuff and that's what we need to focus on and pat ourselves on the back for and go, yay, I actually adopted a new thing this week um, in the way we eat or I changed my you know, like I, I switched to organic apples, one of the high sprayed crops, like just whatever it is to celebrate, make it a message of celebration every time you make a change and still feeling guilty about everything you haven't done yet. And, um, and that's really what the mind chapter kind of speaks to at the start of it. But we also look at a few sort of mindfulness techniques, meditation, um, decluttering even makes a little um, appearance. Uh, just well, I'm big on of- that. We had a podcast all about decluttering with, mm. with a lady who does that for a living. And it's, I must admit, for me, and I'm someone who's moved house a million times, mm. it, it does actually make sense. But I, th- I can see the blockages people have with clutter. Yes. You know, and, and, and how, I mean, I, even in a microwave, even if your desk is really messy sometimes, you just don't feel productive. It's no. bizarre, but it's true. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, we've just moved house as well and we took it as an opportunity to to um, to become KonMari method poster children. So <laughs> perfect. Smell it, love it. <laughs> We're all over it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I'm going to ask you, have you had any special mentors in your life and what have they taught you about success and life? And they don't have to be well-known names. They could be people in your community, but I'd love to hear from you where your sources of inspiration come from. Oh, gosh. Do you know I'm just I'm, I'm just inspired by, you know what, the people who inspire me the most are the people who live in the greatest state of flow with their lives, um, you know, just people who are um, unashamedly doing what they do and um, – I think some of my greatest inspirations have been people like Brene Brown, who's just such an open book about how she experiences life, yet teaches such magnificent teachings in the world. And um, even though we haven't, oh, actually we have met. She did tell me I had nice hair at an event when I walked past her. That was nice. Um, Excellent. <laughs> and, uh, but we haven't actually spoken or anything, but she's impacted my work hugely because vulnerability when you are putting messages out to the world is you know and shame you know is it going to be good enough am I should I even be doing this why is it me doing this I'm probably not even qualified to do you know all that kind of um inner self-talk and and things and I've really drawn on her work um to to be inspired by being a little bit braver and bolder and um and Jude Blarow, who's a wonderful author, um, a whole food chef and author in Australia, she was really the godmother of the whole food back to basics movement here in Australia with her books, has been a wonderful inspiration to me um, uh, just in staying true to yourself. Once again, like for me, it's like half the battle of being in the human experience is staying true to yourself. And I tend to gravitate towards the people who not only stay true to themselves very much so, but encourage me um, and call me on it when I'm not staying true to myself. So, um, yeah. A bit of accountability is a good thing. I agree. So good. Um, So good. Yes. And then um, probably Michael Pollan, another huge influence in my work with the food work he did because food was very much the sort of start for me and then it was reading the wonderful Canadian environmental scientist's book, um, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, which was my spurring into then looking at all of the stuff around the home and stuff that we put on our bodies. So they'd probably be my top ones, yeah. Excellent. So as we wrap up, what would be your top two or three tried and true tips for anyone wanting to embrace the politics of low-tox living? (laughs) So my first thing, I'll give you three changes that you can make that are really easy, low-hanging fruit wins. Um, My first one would be to swap your body product. So whatever you use as a body lotion, because the body surface area is obviously far greater than our face. And if you're thinking, well, I can't do it all today, so what can I swap? first then start with your body lotion and um and just go and get something gorgeous from like uh biome uh, or nourish life or emporio organico three great shops um that you can buy online from and I, I would do that and you just go yay i'm not using something weird on my body anymore fabulous and it 
Absolutely. Mm. And then uh, another one would be to ditch all of your scented candles um, and those home read stick kind of things that all have synthetics in them because um, yes. fragrance does not need to be articulated as to what chemical compounds have been used in that fragrance and very often um, endocrine disruptive compounds are used in that fragrance similar to pesticide in agriculture there's a lot of endocrine disruptive properties in pesticides which is one of the main reasons why they really just don't suit us so that would be my next one just get rid of all the fake stinky stuff and just start to kind of raise your awareness on that so you're at the shops you see a fabric softener you see it called spring fresh think of what gardenias actually really smell like and think of what that smells like (laughs) And realise. And there's no duck involved in those either. No. You know, when you see the duck yeah. or, the, or the kitten or the dog on there or a lamb, oh. a lamb, it was like, wow, that's got nothing to do with this. Oh, it makes me laugh. And when you raise your awareness, you think that actually smells nothing like spring or the ocean or whatever they're trying to tell you it smells like and start to realise what does smell real. Um, that would be my my number one thing. In fact, if you ditch your fabric softener, you're improving your air quality in the inside of your house by up to 90% crazily. So that's, that's a great one to ditch. And then my third one would be think of the word product and think of the word produce and have a look at your trolley or your basket the next time you shop and make a a rough assumption, like a rough calculation on what percentage is product and what percentage is produce and move the needle towards produce over time. So just think, okay, I'm going to just slowly, slowly, slowly move over towards produce in a way that I feel is um, doable, manageable, and I'm going to do it in an inspiring way by connecting with great resources online to, to make it fun. I think that's what it's all about. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you. If you do want to connect further with Alex, we'll have some details on our show notes. Until next time, keep well. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms that's b-e-s-p-o-k-e c-o-m-m-s dot com dot a-u and we'll be sure to get back to you until next time